Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Erin O'Brien. I am Chief Enrollment and Marketing Officer for the University at Buffalo School of Management, and I am pleased to invite you here today or to, uh, to have you join us today for Women Leading Business, our workplace empowerment discussion. Uh, we have an exciting panel for you today of University of Buffalo School of Management graduate alumni, as well as faculty, to share their thoughts with you on how we can lift up women in the workplace, as well as um, bring some inspiration into the conversation, uh, and how each of our alumni were inspired to either um, rise to leadership positions or um, help women rise to leadership positions. Uh, our discussion today, uh, just little housekeeping items, our discussion today will be recorded. Uh, thank you very much for clicking got it on the record button. Um, we will be posting this information later in our digital library so that you can review it afterwards if you registered and weren't able to join us for the live event. Um, we would like to ask you if you're not speaking or asking a question to make sure that your line is muted uh, so that we minimize the background noise and we can hear the great experiences of our panelists. Um, so before we get started, I would like to welcome Professor Chuck Lindsay uh, to our um, to uh, say a couple words, and then we will introduce the rest of the UB Success team who have joined us today. Professor Lindsay, thanks, Aaron. Uh, well, thank you everyone for zooming in and uh, being part of this uh, very important uh, discussion. Uh, so. In terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and specifically uh, male allyship when it comes to uh, females in the workplace and uh, making sure that we're making progress in, in, in that regard and uh, making sure that Aaron talked about females rising to leadership positions, making sure that uh, we are uh, growing that uh, year over year. Uh, more uh, a greater percentage of, of women in leadership positions. I wanted to just bring your attention to a couple of an article and a book. Uh, so Johnson and Smith wrote a recent article in Harvard Business Review, how men can become better allies uh, when it comes to women in the workplace. And uh, they talked about the fact that uh, uh, based on research across uh, many different verticals, uh, different industries and product categories that when men are involved in these uh, efforts, uh, about 96% of organizations show improvement year over year. When men aren't involved, only about 30% of those organizations actually show improvement year over year. Uh, and there's a book that uh, was written by uh, Johnson and Smith also uh, 2020 about a 300 page book that I would encourage uh, you know, everyone in your organizations to, to read in terms of how can we systematically develop a, a system, put a system in place uh, so that everybody in the organization is involved in these very important DEI efforts. Here at UB, uh, we, and in the School of Management, we have, uh, we were an early mover in terms of, uh, of establishing a staff and a faculty diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And when it comes to our working professional programs, uh, specifically our professional MBA program and uh, our uh, online MBA program, which is uh, getting ready to launch in fall of 2023, we have actually distributed to all faculty um, a curated list of cases and articles that actually feature uh, uh, women as uh, the uh, main protagonists uh, in in a in, in might, might be uh, as a, a founder of a company, an entrepreneur, uh, a C-suite level individual, a CEO of, a, of an organization, and we have uh, uh, curated a list of cases and articles that we have uh, sent out, pushed out to all of our faculty to encourage them to look at their cases and, and articles, and uh, you know include. Uh, make sure that uh, some of those uh, uh, cases and articles are are actually included in their in their curriculum. So uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, again, welcome. Thanks for zooming in, and uh, um, 
I'm just going to at this point uh, mute myself and and uh, just uh, you know kind of uh, take be be part of the discussion, the the larger discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lindsay, and thanks, Aaron, for bringing up our success team again. Um, so uh, we'll get to our alumni panelists in a moment, but I'd like to introduce you to the University of Buffalo team who is here to help you successfully um, get into our graduate uh, programs. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Erin O'Brien. I'm Assistant Dean and Chief Enrollment and Marketing Officer, but we also have with us today Megan Wood, who is our Director of Recruiting and Admissions. Megan is actually manning our chat, uh, so I want to encourage you to ask questions during the during during the presentation. Um, you can ask them in the chat and we'll try to raise them to our panel. Um, we'll also have a live Q&A at the end, so you'll have another opportunity to do that as well. Um, next, I would like to introduce Aaron Shaw and Rebecca Mueller. Aaron and Rebecca are um, our assistant directors of recruiting for our programs. Uh, they are fabulous admissions coaches. So if you're interested in enrolling in our programs, Aaron and Rebecca can help you to make sure that you have all of the information that you need and to successfully coach you through the process. Um, and also, I'd like to introduce you to Melissa Ruggiero. And Melissa is a senior associate director of our career. Resource Center. Our Career Resource Center is a dedicated um, career team for our School of Management students, uh, and they are well versed in uh, graduate um, recruiting as well as career planning and preparation. Um, so I'm thrilled that we can bring your UB team to this call today um, to introduce them to you. But really, I'm going to flip over to Rebecca um, so that she can introduce our panelists to you today. The best proof of the success of participating in our programs uh, really are our alumni. And they're the ones who are out there um, in, the, in the world of work, um, acting as both uh, women in the world of work, as well as male mentors in the world, world male allies and mentors in the world of work. That's a very dis difficult thing to say. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca and she's going to get us started with our panelists. Rebecca? Excellent. Thank you, Erin. Yes, we have a great panel for you today. I'm actually going to have them introduce themselves, um, tell you a little bit about what their degrees are from our university, as well as what their current role is. So, um, Mayuri, can you get us started? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm May. Thank you for having me here. I'm really excited. Um, I graduated from UB in May 2021 with Master's in Management Information Systems. My focus was data and healthcare analytics. Currently, I'm working as an IBM consultant for Pfizer, and my role is Solutions Delivery Manager. So excited to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Samantha? Hi, everyone. So sorry you can't see me live. I cannot get my video to work, and it's way above my pay grade figuring out why, but I am thrilled to be here. Um, my name is Samantha Podlis. I graduated with my MBA and my MSW in 2015 and my JD in 2019. Um, I am an associate attorney at Holland and Knight. Um, we're an international firm. I think we have something like 2,000 attorneys throughout 40 countries, but I am based out of the Nashville office. Um, I've been in Nashville for almost three months now, and I don't know if I'll ever come home. It was 75 degrees here all weekend. Um, but my practice focuses on both your standard commercial finance, um, representing lenders and borrowers in both secured and unsecured loan transactions, um, as well as public finance. Um, I have experience in both taxable and tax exempt bond financings um, and representing industrial development agencies, which are um, creatures of statute to spur economic development. Uh, so representing IDAs in um, straight lease transactions. And um, again, thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent, and Peter. Hey, thanks for having me, Rebecca. Um, so I'm Peter Fox. I've been at UB for most of my life. I received my undergraduate uh, from UB in computer science. I went back for my PMBA and graduated in 2017. And I actually, I got a little bit bored during COVID and I signed back up and I'll be completing my business analytics degree uh, this semester, actually. Um, so I've been at Honeywell for about 15 years. My current role is as plant manager and site leader of our Tonawanda facility. And if you don't know, Tonawanda is just a suburb right on the border of Buffalo. Um, 
Uh, not coincidentally, that was right after I completed my MBA. So if anybody needs a, a shameless plug for the value of the MBA program, um, I got my you know current promotion about a year afterwards. So uh, in Honeywell, if you don't know, it's a Fortune 500 company, global presence. I lead a factory, specifically the business I'm in is in the oil and gas industry. Uh, we put together high performance heat exchangers for um, petrochemicals and, and making plastics and things like that. So thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to get started. Um, May, I would like to kick off our first question with you. Um, we'd like you to talk a little bit about, you know, during your time at UB, if you can remember the exact moment that you were really inspired to pursue a leadership role. And then now that you're actually there, what challenges have you faced along the way? Absolutely. So at UB, I worked on many projects and it was crucial for me when starting a project just to get clear on the goals right at the start, create a plan. I like to organize my work and finish projects ahead of schedule. So as a result, whenever we were required to form a group, I would reach out to potential members and bring them together. And I always felt accountable bringing in from different groups together. I believe the agility, establishing connection and being accountable, not just to sustain the progress of the project, but to accelerate it gave me a motivation. Um, just trying to make a dent whenever it is possible. Also, um, I learned about the student engagement leadership program. I learned about it. I took that and it taught me how important it is to be effective leader. Uh, so these opportunities developed my leadership skills, which helped me tremendously when it came to market myself on my resume and in the interviews. Also, um, I was the student ambassador, thanks to Erin, and then uh, thanks to Melissa for always, you know, backing us, going through my resumes multiple times. So uh, those are just like part of the great people we have here. Um, also, like I was fortunate to have a lot of opportunities, women professor um, uh, from Career Resource Center and leaders backing me. My greatest challenge was and is balancing my commitments to my family and my career. Also, there were instances where external environment can be a little challenging, such as working in some cultures, coming from India, moving here, it was a big move. Uh, but in such situation, I observed and tried to be better understand the context and adapted myself to the environment. Um, in my opinion, I think organizations like UB and IBM and so on can do a lot to support women who are aspiring to in the senior leadership roles. It is essential to have the genuine vision for inclusion and diversity in the workplace and back this up with structure and processes. At IBM, we have BRGs, the business resource groups like women at IBM, where we aspire to foster culture of gender equality through career planning and progress, progression, knowledge sharing, uh, community building and networking. We have so many groups. Um, uh, Western New York has a women group. Uh, we have a women in tech conference tomorrow. Um, in Seneca one in downtown. So all these groups, they help you a lot. So, yeah. Excellent. Great response. I really, I love how you talked a little bit about how, you know, at the University of Buffalo, you just had the opportunities here. You had, you know, the engagement of leadership, really the, the different ways to get involved, being a student ambassador. And then even once you graduated, you know, getting involved in, in groups and organizations in the area and within your organization. So uh, really great ways to kind of be inspired is just have those opportunities available and, and take advantage of them. Uh, so excellent. So one thing you did catch on, or one thing that you did touch on rather, was kind of that work-life balance and just kind of sometimes it can be a challenge juggling all that. So that kind of leads into my next question for Samantha, um, which talks a little bit more about that. So a common trend amongst our students really is this effective time management skills. So can you talk a little bit about how, how you balance your personal and professional life and what strategies you found to be effective for managing both your time and your priorities? Sure. So I am very much a type A personality. 
Um, it is something, it's a blessing and a curse at times. So I think one of the big things I try and do is I try and plan out my days. Um, and I will say nine times out of 10, the day does not go at all like I planned. So you have to be kind of willing to, uh, you know, bringing in some, you know, leader core um, competencies, uh, be able to adapt and be able to move past that maybe your day doesn't look like you thought it was going to look. Um, but when when that happens, I then try and, um, you know, set a time that, okay, by maybe 7 p.m., I'm going to log off. I'm not going to touch my phone until, I'd like to say the rest of the night, but sometimes it is not until, you know, 9 p.m., 10 p.m. when I've kind of made myself dinner, walked my dog, you know, kind of wound down for the day. I think the hardest thing um, probably for all of us is we're accessible regardless of where we are, um, you know, with the advent of cell phones. My email is on my cell phone. Um, our billable, the program we use for billable hours is on our cell phone. So if I'm responding to a client and emailing, I I can then just build that time right on my phone and you kind of find yourself never taking a break and stepping back. Um, so again, like I said, I do try and sit here and, um, you know, cut off by a certain time every single day. I try and if I have to work the weekend, I try and either not work one of the days and, um, you know, maybe I don't work Saturday, I only work Sunday. Um, try and plan it out that way. Obviously, it's very much a work in progress. It's something I... I've been out practicing now. This is my fourth year. I still struggle with every single day. And what I've tried to do differently in this job, um, it, when I joined this firm rather than my last firm, I've tried to draw boundaries right from the get-go. You know, if we're closing a deal, like I said, you may have those 12, 13, 14 hour days, but if we're not, and it's something that you get in at 7 p.m. that is not emergent, I try and say, okay, I'm gonna not do it until tomorrow morning. Maybe tomorrow morning means 6 a.m. if I, you know, my insomnia gets the best of me, but I, you just have to try and I, it's something I've tried to draw those boundaries and to force yourself to log off and to take time for yourself because it's very easy to fall into the trap of not doing that. Um, and then you, you know, face burnout and, you know, nothing good comes from that. So I, I think the biggest thing is just to try and draw boundaries right out the gate. Excellent. And I, I love how you said to try because it, it is very <laughs> difficult, especially uh, like you mentioned, being completely accessible um, nowadays is, is very difficult to, to do, but, you know, trying to set that schedule and stick to it and, and really drawing those boundaries um, is really important. And like you mentioned, it is a work in progress. We, of course, have to be able to adapt eventually, you know, to, to certain situations and we can't always stick within those strict timelines, but it's definitely important, you know, for, for work-life balance and just for overall uh, mental health. So thank you. Um, Peter, I would love to hear a little bit about your experiences as far as how you really promote diversity and inclusion within your organization and what steps you've taken to really advocate for women specifically to create a more inclusive workplace. So I've got a bit of a two-part answer here. Um, and I think Mary touched on a couple of uh, my, my first point um, at IBM. A lot of companies are doing a lot of things policy-wise to create a more inclusive atmosphere. Um, specifically at Honeywell, uh, over the past couple of years, we've really grown the employee resource groups. Um, we've got you know, a, a focused group for all sorts of different things. Um, the, for women is one of the, the first ones. Um, and we've got specific groups within Honeywell for women in engineering and things like that. It, you know, historically, at least at, at the business I'm in, manufacturing and engineering in the oil and gas industry, not heavy on women in the workplace uh, historically. It's just been a traditionally male industry. Um, so some, sometimes company policies are absolutely necessary to um, get the ball rolling in the right direction. Uh, one of the biggest things that I think has been key to um, enabling women to move up in, a, in our business is we've got formal succession plans. We've got a centralized system, um, and this, these are reviewed regularly. Every quarter they get reviewed, and they're reviewed for representation, not just for women, but people of color as well, um, to make sure that we're really getting the best talent we can. We're not waiting for a leader to leave the organization um, and then starting our search. 
right? Then, then you then you take the first or second person in the door. You really need to fill the role. Um, so that's really been helpful. Uh, we've requested blind resumes from our recruiting department, and by that I mean um, identification is redacted. Lo any location and name has been blacked out before we get the resume. Uh, and until we either accept or reject the interview, we wouldn't. Well, we would if we reject the interview, we'd never see their name. Um, and then, as far as uh, make as far as bringing people in the door, I guess the next step is they'd have to accept the role, right? And uh, ensuring a, divor a diverse interviewing panel is, is absolutely critical. The biggest thing that we've heard from people turning down a role, especially in the engineering field, is they looked around and didn't see a single person that reminded them of themselves. Um, half of my leadership, it's a small leadership team, I, half of them are women, and they are part of every interview. Um, I would never ever want anybody to not work in my facility because they felt like it was specific to any, any group. Um, so that, that's, those are a couple things that a company can do, but specifically as a leader, um, I think the most important thing is allowing, creating a comfortable atmosphere and a culture of openness where employees are not afraid to speak their minds. You should never be afraid to talk to your manager uh, or your leader um, about something that's bothering you, especially something you know so significant as I'm not comfortable for 40 hours a week. You know nobody should nobody should be like that, right? Um, and I think the way you build that atmosphere of trust is really through advocating and protecting your employees, whether women or not, right? Um, sometimes that means highlighting exceptional work. Um, sometimes that means pushing for fair and equal pay, which I've had to do. I, I was required to put together four slides, with our org, organizational structure, um, our proposed ratings for the following year. I, I, I stuck a slide in there to show the distribution of pay at the site with a little line down the middle of average pay. And, and I put mo mostly women on the left side of that line. Um, and that got action. Sometimes you just can't be, you, you, gotta, you can't be afraid to call things out when you see it. Uh, and sometimes it's just allowing your employees to vent in a constructive way so that they feel heard. You know, it's that go, sometimes no action is needed, but listening to your employees. Uh, but once, when you have an atmosphere of trust, then, then the, the next thing to do to make sure that everybody has the oppor same opportunities is challenge everybody equally and let everybody fail equally. Um, and if you don't see those opportunities coming to you, fight for them, request them, say, hey, I saw this project is coming up. I think I have some... I have some stuff to contribute to that. Would you mind if I worked on it? Um, and just in case you don't have a, a, a manager that's really pushing for that, right? So be heard, speak up. There's most of the time, if you're not getting the opportunities you think you deserve, it's because there's somebody who doesn't know that you have the capability or doesn't right is, isn't actively looking for that and actively thinking about that so you know raise your hand um that's all i have excellent yeah that was a, a really good response you, you kind of hit on uh, hit on really three key things there which is you know that the companies are um taking action you know you as a leader are taking action as far as the advocacy and and really protecting your employees and then you know, the, the third and final one there is just self-advocacy for yourself. So it really is kind of a, a three-part uh, answer, which is all very valid. So that was amazing. Thank you. Um, moving on to May. Um, now, our students are really known to thrive in a team dynamic and often use collaborative, supportive, and family as words to describe the School of Management here at UB. So can you talk a little bit about how you foster a culture of collaboration and teamwork and what strategies you found effective for building strong relationships with your colleagues? Sure. Um, so building a culture of collaboration may require a fair amount of effort and technology, of course, because everybody is remote now. 
Um, at IBM, we have diverse workforce and every individual have varying thought process. So we encourage to respect every individual perspective, uh, make sure that everyone is valued with their views. Doing that helps uh, maintain a balance that everyone is equal and reduce the bias. Um, I would also recommend interacting with your coworkers, your colleagues, your classmates, as it becomes easier to build relationships. Uh, you should develop these opportunities whenever you get a chance. Um, listening is also essential for effective communication. So when meeting people, colleagues, associate, it is important to put your listening skills to good use and being self-aware, taking responsibility for your words and actions. Um, lastly, show your appreciation when others help you. Everyone likes appreciation and wants to feel as if they are making a worthwhile contribution. So a little genuine praise goes a long way in developing good working relationship. Um, your school projects, group projects, and teaming prepares you for all that. Um, at IBM, we are continuously collaborating, and I have learned a lot of that from my education at School of Management, uh, the value of being a team player, the team dynamics we are experiencing here will be extremely helpful to you throughout your career. Um, we also use multiple tools like mural boards to brainstorm ideas, WebEx for meeting and teaming. We also do a lot of lunch and learns and in-person events whenever possible. So these are just as important. Great. Yeah, you definitely learn a lot about that, too, just going to get your master's degree as well. You talked about, you know, the, the listening skills and how effective that is for communication. Sometimes that can get a little lost. Um, sometimes people in communication, they think just the speaking piece, not necessarily the, the listening piece. So great. I'm going to go um, shift back over to Peter and talk a little bit about something that you mentioned earlier on, um, but talking about how faculty are not only teaching at the university, but are also really active in their particular fields, whether that be research or consulting, um, which is a really a tremendous advantage for our students. So can you talk a little bit about how you stay up to date with the latest trends and developments in your field and what resources you rely on for your professional development? Well, as I mentioned before, I rely on UB for some of my professional development, which is why I'm back. Um, but outside of that, um, well, since I left off the last answer with what you should do for yourself, same, same thing goes here. With your self-improvement and your personal development, you have to own it. Nobody will care about you as much as you do. Um, so that's the biggest piece of advice. Secondly, carve out some time for yourself. It's not as easy to learn and grow when there aren't five or six professors yelling at you twice a week to get your homework done um, and things like that. So it, it, is, it is incredibly more difficult to have the same level of, of growth uh, as you know when you're in a, in a degree or something like that. So you really need to find out what works for you. Um, reading the newspaper when you have um, the TV on, things like that, that's not, that's not development. You really need to carve out time and put forth the same, the same kind of effort you have to do when you are doing a paper for school. Um, if you don't have that same approach, you're, you're not gonna get the same, same return uh, on your time. Um, there are lots of tangible resources out there, some through UB, um, some not. I have to have I have to plug my favorite resource at UB is the, the UB library website. Uh, if you've never had any of your uh, well, for those currently at UB, go check it out. For those uh, future students, make a note. Some of the databases in UB, um, they're in the, in the UB library. They're they're some of the best resources for learning about industries. Uh, I know a couple of them have changed names in the last few years, but Factiva and Ibis World and uh, Hoover's. Um, make a note, look into those. Um, <clears throat> as far as, so there's two sides of the, the coin here that you guys should really focus on professional development. One is those technical skills, uh, you know, how to read a balance sheet, things like that. Um, management skills, the soft skills, the hard skills, all of that, but those technical skills. Uh, Chuck mentioned recent 
articles in Harvard Business Review. It's a great one, right? It's more than just a source for your homework while you're in school. The Harvard Business Review, the Sloan Management Review, um, the California Management Review, these are a lot of great resources to stay updated on management skills. On the other side of things, regardless of the role you're in, you need to know your business. Um, for me, the most important tool is the Wall Street Journal. Um, on any given day, I got it. I need to be aware of uh, the geopolitical situation in Taiwan and the price of nickel and any big swings. And reading the newspaper is one of the biggest advantages you can have in any area. Um, and most of your peers aren't going to be reading it. So it can really be an advantage. Uh, read the newspaper, listen to podcasts, become aware of any trade publications in the industry you're in. Even if you don't understand them, read them. Um, and professional organizations. It's the other place that I, I try to stay up to date. Um, there's a lot, the Project Management Institute, the Association, the American Society for Quality um, that I belong to. I read, they've got their own technical journals. They're great resources. Uh, and they also offer professional certifications that can advance your career after you're out of school. So that's all I got. <clears throat> so yeah, that feeds beautifully into what Sam was saying earlier about work-life balance, you know, work and life and all that, you know, it, it also you want it, it make sure that you're carving out time for that professional development and staying up to date with your industry. So um, really some great advice there. I'm going to send it back over to Sam. I want to know a little bit about uh, how you see the role of women in leadership really evolving in the coming years and what changes you would like to see in the corporate world to support the evolution. Sure. So I think as far as what changes I see, I just see more women um, in leadership roles. Uh, you know, um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she's one of my idols. She was on the Supreme Court and she was asked once, when will uh, when will there be enough women sitting on the court? And she said, when there are nine, and that's the full, this, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court. So I think you, you're going to see more women in leadership roles. When I first started only just four years ago, I was the only, especially in finance, I was the only woman out with client lunches. I was working for all male partners. This was at my last work firm. Just four years later at my new firm, I looked around in the elevator. We, um, myself and some of my colleagues went out and there was only one male in the elevator with us. So I think you're going to see a lot more women in leadership roles, um, you know, climbing, breaking the glass ceiling. It's something that, as I just, you know, as I mentioned, I've seen just in the last four years and I think it's only going to get better. And as far as what changes I'd like to see, um, I think just for women to continue lifting as they climb. Um, I have been incredibly fortunate to have some incredible female mentors, some who are on this call right now who have checked in on me, have invested in me, saw something in me when I might not have seen it in myself. And, you know, I think there are unfortunately still are women out there who believe, well, I went through this really tough road to get to where I am. And, um, you know, they believe then that other women should go through that as well. It builds character, it builds grit, it builds determination. I personally don't believe that. I believe that, you know, if I can make the road easier for somebody, uh, more e easier for somebody than it was for myself, I would be more than happy to do that. So I'd love to just continue to see women, um, you know, supporting other women. And, you know, uh, that's it, Erin, <laughs> I see you. And that's my favorite quote, women lifting as they climb. That is something that I think we can all continue to do and do more of. Excellent. Thank you so much for your wonderful responses to our questions. I am now going to pass it over to my colleague, Aaron Shaw, and he's going to um, ask the panel some questions that we had from um, our participants that uh, registered early, and then also um, some career-related questions for um, our CRC representative. Yeah, guys. Uh, so that concludes the, the individual answer uh, portion of today's uh, conversation. We're going to move to more of a, a group approach 
uh, keeping the panelists uh, in mind and answering these questions, uh, kicking things off with the fact that I think we can all agree it's not a secret that leaders are faced with difficult decisions every day. We've heard some of that here so far. Um, but for our panelists, and anybody feel free to jump in here. How do you approach decision making as a whole? And what factors do you consider when making tough choices? I counted to three in my head. And as we all know, Aaron O'Brien likes to talk about this all the time in, <laughs> in business school. Uh, if you don't volunteer, you are then voluntold. Uh, Peter, I saw you unmute yourself, so I'm guessing you're going to jump in. I'll jump in. I have very short and clear advice for this kind of thing. Um, nine times out of 10, the answer is not very clear, right? In the business world, it's always weigh the costs, weigh the benefits, and the likelihood of success. That's always the business school answer, and it's going to be the answer on most papers that you turn in. However, generally, it, the answer is not that clear. The costs are not that clear. The benefits are not that clear. And the likelihood of success is not that clear. My best advice is try to recognize when there's not a perfect answer and make the, just make the decision. Don't be afraid to make a, a wrong decision is what I'm saying. It'll, it's not likely, well, sometimes it's, it's possible that your decision is not a life or death situation and that it's not a win or lose tens of millions of dollars situation. It, it will be that down the line, but up until then, you know, it's, just don't be afraid to be wrong. The, the worst thing a leader can do is not make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, make the decision, own it, live with it. And if you're wrong, learn from it and make a better one next time. I just want to echo that really quickly, Peter. I, I wholeheartedly agree with the life or death scenario. I, you know, my dad's an ER physician and that is legitimate life and death right there if he makes a mistake. Not that what we all do is not important and valuable. It certainly is. But I think I spent so much of my first couple of years practicing and not having confidence, having to walk into the partner's office next door to me and run by every possible scenario. You know more than you think you know. Proceed with confidence. And as Peter said, if you make a mistake, you learn from it and you're not going to do it again. And that's the main thing. Aaron, you have an answer. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on this. Um, and it 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 echoes uh, what both Peter and Sam just said. Um, and we say it a lot here in the university world. Um, we're in the business of improving lives, not saving lives. Uh, and so it gives you the freedom to step back and look at that decision that you're faced with um, and how you might be able to get to the right place. Um, and I find that, you know, if you're a woman sitting at the table and you're in a position where you're being asked to make a decision, um, I take a consultative approach because that happens to me a lot. Right. I'm sitting at the table, the table's looking at me and they're saying, you know, you have to make a decision, a big decision. And it's usually impactful. But again, we improve lives. We don't save lives. It's an impactful, but not a life saving decision. Um, and, you know, I, I take a consultative approach and a consultative evidence based approach. So I bring forward the information that I have so that I'm on solid footing and I get people to understand the perspective of making that decision. Um, and you know, it goes back to uh, what Peter was saying, you know, you don't want to sacrifice the good in the pursuit of perfection. No decision is perfect. You just have to accept that moving forward. And you have to rest your confidence on that. Um, and you bring the evidence forward for what your decision is. And you make your decision in that period of time with the evidence that you have. And it may be different a week later. It may be different two years later. Um, you might have new information. But at the time, if you take a consultative approach, um, it puts you on an equal footing with the rest of the table, where the rest of the table might be, there might be a male-female power dynamic at that table, but there also might be, um, you know, an authority superiority dynamic where, um, you know, you're trying to rise to that position uh, in, in terms of your of your decision making. So so I think really to kind of net it out, um, it's don't be afraid to make the decision. Um, you know, realize that you're 
that your decision is improving lives. It's not life or death in, in the majority of the cases. And that the, um, you know, that you, you rest your decision on the information that you have and in it, you posit that decision in a consultative way. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question, uh, which focuses on mental health. And in recent years, uh, a shift in how and where people conduct their work has had a major impact on mental health, resulting in a larger emphasis being placed on this topic from employers. So anybody who wants to jump in, how do you cultivate a positive work environment and what steps do you take to support the mental health and well-being of your employees? I'm happy to jump in. I, I I think just to really dumb it down, I just try and be a nice person to work for and work with. I, I mean, it is, I saw something on LinkedIn recently, but it's a massively underrated career hack just to be kind. And I think that is, at the end of the day, how I try and approach every scenario, both you know, when I'm on a, a whole team of people, when I have juniors working under me, and when I'm working for partners above me, um, you know, I, I it's it's just such we're all we all go through bad days, we all go through stressful days, we all go through hard times, and I think to be a team player and to acknowledge that and recognize that and try and you know we're all in team based atmospheres to try and work through that with your team is just how I try and approach scenarios. And also playing off that as a, be a team player. If somebody says to you, you know, I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed, I can't get to it. Okay, instead of having a sarcastic remark or saying, you know, I've, I've been said, okay, well, work, work longer hours. Okay, what can we do? Do you want me to take part of it? Um, do we want, do we need to get somebody else involved? Just when you're on a team, continue to check in and, um, you know, <laughs> again, just to just, just be kind. It's, it's underrated. And I don't, I think we forget about that a lot when we're in such client driven businesses. And just to reiterate on my point, listen, just listen. Like sometimes listening can just help you listening to others, what they are going through, just trying to understand what is happening. It's it's like, it's really helpful just to listen to people. Also, when you're feeling overwhelmed, like just shut everything out, try to organize yourself, make a list of the things to do, decide your priorities. That helps out a lot. And there are groups at Incorporate. There are groups that support mental health. Uh, there are groups that support physical, like in all ways, like we have activities and things planned out. So do not shy away from joining those. Um, and there are mental health days, people take it. So it's it's really common. Just, just take advantage of all those things. Yeah, excellent advice. Thank you so much. Okay, Melissa, we're going to uh, lean on your expertise at this point in time. Um, so if you don't mind jumping in here and sharing based on your experience, what career related challenges do women have to prepare for? And in coaching female students, what strategies have you used to address these challenges and how successful have they been? Thank you for asking. Um, and to reiterate, I'm Melissa Ruggiero, Senior Associate Director in the Career Resource Center. I help our graduate level students figure out what they want to do, find internships, find full-time jobs, and I also work with our alumni. Uh, so research shows us that women are less likely to advocate for themselves, right? Uh, for example, they're less likely to ask for a referral from men. Uh, we've seen that in the Gender Insights report that was out, what is a year ago or so? Um, and to a great degree, women are less likely to negotiate for compensation when they receive a job offer. So we want to be a resource to help our students, whether they're developing a network, um, so mentors, sponsors, personal board of directors to learn how to, how to do that by seeing how others have done it, all the way through landing their job and making sure that they advocate um, for the payoff that they deserve. And we do this in a few ways. So we emphasize diversity in our meetings with alumni. We, we bring in alumni to do things called realistic job previews during our 
orientations. Um, we have events called Power Chats where we have alumni come in in person or virtual to do Power Chats. Um, we have events uh, like the one that I run in New York City called Network New York. And <clears throat> we make sure that they are diverse in many ways, gender, race, experience, career path, but definitely in gender. And we do that to broaden the horizons and, and help our students, including our female students, so that they can envision themselves in roles that they may never have considered before. And some of our power chats, I just want to share a few with you. Um, we had Dana Suspaniak, who works for the Professional Fighters League, and she focused in her talk on the importance of FaceTime and, and in breaking into an existing group of men who, um, but what I mean is they had a, a they were a group of men who had existing relationships and how um, she started to work with a group of men who had been working together for a long time. Natia Bata, co-founder of a local fintech organization um, who focused on starting a business in a very male dominated environment. <clears throat> and um, she had a non-tech background. So how did she do that? Um, Snigda Sharma, she was a director is the director and strategic finance leader at Walmart. She talks about her rise through such organizations as American Express, Amgen, and eBay. And um, recently we had Rebecca Van Buren. She is transportation operations manager at JP Hunt Transportation, who works in a very male dom dominated industry. These, now, these are just a few examples of um, women that we brought in <clears throat> for our graduate level students. Um, and for small group conversations, and we do this on a regular basis, and we focus on um, identifying role models for you so that they can be inspirations. And we have systems in place and uh, ways for students to identify mentors, our database of alumni and, and friends of the school um, who often volunteer to talk with their students and share their expertise and practice. Um, and, and sometimes our students need an extra little push. So when students come and talk with me, um, they might be the kind of person who won't go out there and, and just chat up the average everyday person. So I might go out of my way to introduce that person to someone electronically or in person when I think that they could benefit from that individual introduction. Um, and so women need mentors, but they don't just need female mentors. We heard earlier in today's chat that um, statistically men make more referrals than women do. So we like to encourage women to have male mentors as well as female mentors. Uh, and um, I believe Professor Lindsay referenced some articles that could be helpful in, in understanding that. So at the career advising level, we do a lot of confidence building. Um, and the increase in, in confidence is very important in practice interviews. And I, I remember talking with Mary about um, how to interview very well in showcasing confidence. And the Career Resource Center um, reinforces what to improve on um, in gaining respect in a room your tone of voice, your body language, what to practice, um, how, you can, how you can garner respect from individuals and hold your own under stress. So that's some of the things that we do. Well, that's a lot. So thank you for <laughs> sharing all of that um, in great detail. Uh, moving on now uh, back to Aaron O'Brien. And for the audience, if you're not familiar with the, the class profiles across each of our programs, some of them are predominantly made up of international students. Uh, so Aaron, in regards to the hardships faced by international women, um, what are they and, and how can our students overcome them? Sure. Thank you, Aaron. Um, you know, we, we, we bring in a lot of international women uh, Maori being one, into our um, graduate business programs here at the University of Buffalo School of Management. And um, I have seen over and over again, sometimes we have a uh, women, our, our women students have 
a cultural challenge um, that uh, that they have to overcome as well as everything that we've discussed here today. Um, and as they move from being students out into their post degree careers um, and establishing themselves, um, there's there's a couple things that are are even more challenging for international women as opposed to domestic US women. Um, there's a, a cultural confidence factor. There's a cultural um, factor that is, um, I, I wanna call it uh, being demure in the face of male authority or um, putting ourselves in a position where we are secondary to male authority. Um, and that that's a, you know, you're talking about cultural change that is is learned behavior and lived experience over a, over a lifetime um, and multi-generationally. Um, and maybe, Mayori, maybe you might be able to jump in and maybe talk about your experience and how you transitioned into the U.S. economy and how you had to overcome any challenge, any cultural challenges that you may have felt as a woman moving into a more Western male dominant economy? Yeah, so um, I mean, when I moved to uh, US, uh, the only reason I went to school of management was to understand the cultural differences, just to get to know how, you know, the communication and it helped me a lot and grabbing all the opportunities, I guess, like being a student ambassador, I reached out to Aaron and he was like, of course, and reaching out to Melissa, reaching out to different people, just trying to understand, just gauge the situation and jump into different scenarios. I think that's what helps you overcome that fear. And the more you get engaged, more you start learning. And, and I think that's important, whether you are um, a U.S. citizen or not a U.S. citizen, as you as you move from that um, post degree world out into the world of work, um, and that there's a lesson in there for all of us is that you have to understand the landscape that you're dealing with um, and recognize that there may be um, deeply ingrained cultural issues that you face, um, as well as your own personal cultural. Um, uh, environment that you grew up in that you're that you might be overcoming um, and and I think what Melissa was talking about was the um, uh, you know women tend to be less um, I don't want to say the word aggressive Melissa what word did you use it definitely wasn't aggressive but um, aggressive in in self-promotion I guess so Aaron back to you yeah very good um, so there is one more question uh, was it assertive? Assertive, not aggressive. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> there you go. Um, and the, the final question deals with navigating gender biases and stereotypes in the workplace. I know that, that Peter had touched on this a little bit in terms of what they're doing over at Honeywell. Uh, but Aaron, what advice do you have for, for other women facing similar challenges when it comes to gender bias and stereotypes? And, and specifically, I'm thinking of a couple other questions that were put out there uh, regarding pay, equal pay as well. Yeah, if I could solve the equal pay problem, um, I would be a genius um, and lauded by women all over the world. I don't know if I can solve that problem. Um, but, you know, we've, as women in the workplace, we've made an enormous amount of progress. Um, but I think the, the one thing um, that we cannot do is rest on that progress. Um, it, you know, just because we've made some progress does not mean we've made all the progress we could possibly make. Um, and I recently uh, looked up um, the Fortune 500 companies, female CEOs who lead the Fortune 500 companies. We've been stuck at around 8% for a very long time. That's 8% of all the Fortune 500 companies. Um, and that's that's not a lot. And we've recently, for the first time ever, hit 10% of the Fortune 500 list. Um, and that brings the total number of female CEOs in the in Fortune 500 companies to 53 out of 500. There is so much work that we have to do in terms of gender biases and stereotypes um, and overcoming that in order to be able to progress ourselves 
uh, into um, positions of authority and leadership. Um, when we look at something like higher education, higher education tends to be uh, a female dominated industry across the board, except in positions of power. So when you look at the, the power dynamics and the gender imbalance in, in the world of work, and I only reference higher education because that's the world I'm in, I was with IBM. And we, you know, we had fabulous, as, as May said, we had fabulous IBM programs and leadership that we were able to look to that overcame those biases and stereotypes. Um, but you know, even IBM still hasn't solved the, the gender pay inequity. Um, so I think there's lots and lots of work for us to do, but the first thing that we have to do is be present and be aware that those stereotypes still exist and those biases still exist. And we have to do everything that we talked about in the last hour, which is, um, you know, as women in the workplace, lift one another up, harness our male allies, you know, and as men in the workplace recognize that those gender stereotypes are real and those biases are real and that um, as men in the workplace, um, you know, you have to actively um, continue to lift women up and, um, and, and work with women as in a reverse mentoring situation. Um, I think in all of this, it takes a village. Uh, it, if we ignore it, it's going to backslide. So progression is hard fought and over many years, but we need to continue to do that and to continue to chip away at the Mount Everest of these biases and gender stereotypes. And I'm grateful that I work in a place where we can have this conversation openly and you know, and we can make progression against it in a, in a really transparent and visual and recognized way. Yeah, outstanding. Thank you for your thoughts, Aaron. Okay, we've got about oh, approximately 15 minutes or so uh, left to open it up to you, the audience, uh, for any of the questions that you may have for either our panelists, uh, all the other staff members or faculty that are present here today. Um, I'll get the ball rolling and I'll kick things off. Um, I know Melissa's got some more uh, thoughts and, and opinions to share um, on an important topic. So Melissa, we'll get started with you uh, in this particular segment. Uh, what can women do to be taken more seriously in the workplace and how can they establish authority uh, for self-advocacy? Well, I, I'd love to hear what some of our alumni panelists have to do with uh, think about this too, but um, at the CRC and the Career Resource Center, uh, we have this conversation with our students often about uh, how can we garner respect uh, from individuals in the room, especially during the interview or when we're doing a case competition or when we're in a team. I have these conversations with my leader course students all the time. Um, so, you know, it, it has a lot to do with if the people you're talking to get an idea that you understand who you are and where you're going, and if you know how you're getting there. So um, if you know those things and it's apparent to the people around you, that's going to help you. So it starts there. And that's one of the ways that we help. Um, and if, if that's not clear to you, fake it till you make it, right? <laughs> Ask lots of questions that can help you get to the point where you understand where you want to go. Uh, but I can tell you when you are, speaking with another person, male or female, but especially female, uh, and you get an idea that that person knows where they're going and what they want, you tend to respect them more. You, you tend to feel like they have authority because they understand themselves. They, they know what's happening. Um, so that's, that's one way that, that we help them. And that's one way I recommend that our women, um, it's a step that they take to help them gain respect and authority um, in their own surroundings. Um, we've had conversations with, with students on how they can, what they can do say in interviews on their dress, the space that they take up um, physically uh, and you know, the, the perception that they're making. And so I would practice prior to presentations and prior to interviews and Ask the people you're practicing with to give comments to you on that part 
of the perception that you're giving out as well. Uh, so that, that makes a difference. Excellent. Panelists, May? Yeah, and I agree with Melissa. I, I remember at least two to three times Melissa just practicing interviewing me, and I'm really thankful for that, and always telling me to take up the challenges. Um, when I was at UB, I was looking for internship, and I had no idea because my resume only contained like my uh, education from India and my work from India, how to best put it here, how to be confident, how to go applying for internships, like um, the advice that Melissa gave me is just right what she said right now, exactly the same thing. Just be confident, be clear on what you are looking for. And if you are not, fake it till you make it. And I made and it. <laughs> do you remember, Mary, we, we, we were talking about um, the value of quantifiable results and-, and right. You you're seem you seem like more of a authority, or you are more of an authority if you can uh, use data to prove your point. And exactly, even if you're not a data oriented person by nature. If you can in incorporate um, statistics in your proof, um, it it will make you come across as more authoritative. Exactly. Yeah. The same thing. Like when I said I manage people, she asked me to put how many people did you manage? I work for the client. I did this, like give some numbers, show some statistics there. And that's the way to do. So, yeah. Outstanding. Okay. Uh, Again, the floor is yours, uh, folks in the audience. If you've got questions, feel free to either unmute your mic or utilize the chat box, and we will direct it as needed. Okay. Well, I mean, an hour plus of conversation does tend to answer quite a few questions. So I, if there's none out there, uh, we will move towards wrapping up and I will pass it back to Aaron O'Brien. Thank you, Aaron Shaw. Um, we have two Aaron's on our team, so sometimes we get complicated. Um, so um, I want to, first of all, thank everybody who joined us today, um, and specifically our alumni panelists. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion, the best re representation of our UB brand and our School of Management brand is the students that we put out into the world and our alumni are our success proof points. And in this particular case, they've brought the experience of their, um, their working in the in the uh, in the in the world of work um, with a cognizant and um, transparent knowledge of either being a woman or lifting up women in the workplace. Um, I'm grateful for your experience and for your sharing your experience with our audience today. Um, and secondly, I want to thank. Um, our UB team for joining us, specifically um, Melissa and Professor Lindsay. Thank you for also bringing your expertise into the conversation uh, and showing our audience uh, the type of support that is possible here at the University of Buffalo School of Management. And finally, I would like to thank our audience for joining us today. Um, you know, it's been great having you as part of our circle of learning. Um, you know, we host these lunch and learn sessions so that we have an opportunity to have an open discussion around um, you know, what it's like for women in the workplace. We also have events for diversity in the workplace, as well as some other events that you can find on management.buffalo.edu. But we have an opportunity to have transparent discussions so that you as our audience members can see the type of environment that you might be able to participate in um, as a student here at the University of Buffalo, specifically in our working professional programs. Um, and the, the learning doesn't stop today in this webinar. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of our session, um, this, this session is recorded and we'll transcript it uh, and post it in our digital library. I know we've had some of our audience members who are interested in sharing this information. Um, and um, 
uh, Aaron has so nicely put up our uh, get connected or stay connected information. If you are interested in pursuing any one of our graduate degrees, uh, there are QR codes on the screen right now. If you can use your phone and take a quick snapshot of the QR code, um, you can introduce yourself to Rebecca or Aaron, and they would be happy to answer your questions about, um, about being a prospective student uh, for one of our graduate programs. We have lots of ways to connect here at the University of Buffalo School of Management. Uh, Mayori mentioned uh, she was one of our ambassadors. We have many student ambassadors willing to share their experience with you. Um, you have an opportunity to participate in classes if you're interested in knowing what it's like. Maybe you're coming back to school after having been gone for a long time and you're interested in what it's like being a student again. Uh, we have many admissions events. Uh, Aaron and Rebecca will conduct one-on-one -on -one advising What's to help coach MSBA? you through the process. Oh, I'm going to put, I think, thank you for going on mute. Um, and we have lots of content that we put out on our website and social media. Um, if you haven't already connected with us on social media, please do. You can find our links on management.buffalo.edu, as well as links to our podcast and our blog. Um, and our podcast and our blog are written and produced by uh, our own students. So you really get an opportunity to dig into um, what life is like here at the University of Buffalo School of Management. And finally, our digital library, which you will have access to um, again on our website. So I would encourage you if you are interested in our programs to really uh, explore what uh, program is right for you. Um, we've recently launched online programs which are designed specifically for working professionals like yourselves. Um, and so if you're interested in the working professional program, uh, please contact Rebecca or Aaron and they'll be able to share information. If you are on this call and you're intending on participating in our campus-based programs, which are more of a full-time schedule for traditional students, again, reaching out to Aaron and Rebecca uh, to help them coach you through the process, as well as answer questions. Um, and if you've already been admitted to our programs, we are thrilled that you uh, will be joining us and becoming a UB School of Management graduate student. Um, and we look forward to your arrival whenever the start of your term is, whether the next, next step is uh, summer or fall. Um, so I want to thank everybody again for their participation today. Um, take a quick snap with your phone of this um, of this slide so that you can reach out to us later. Or if you don't have the opportunity to do so, you can always reach us on management.buffalo.edu. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great day.